Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you want to support, you can head over to oxum.substack.com, subscribe to the newsletter for just five bucks a month. There's a whole ton of free content and just a little bit of stuff that's beyond the paywall. That's aksum.substack.com. You can also support the video and audio podcast ventures here and at toahado.transistor with patreon.com slash toahado that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o today i have matthew cooper back with us today we delved into eurasia and uh, russia and china and america last time we were here since his last visit the uh, so-called borat 2 or borat subsequent movie film has come out to give folks kind of a background I grew up saying what it is and Buyakasha and respect and all these things because I grew up on Sasha Baron Cohen's character, especially uh, I would say Ali G was especially the one that I, I watched the most on HBO. But later on, I would I would watch a little bit Bruno, although that was not my favorite. I would watch it as well. And like everyone else, I was I was suckered into Borat before I ever knew what Kazakhstan was. I had a, a friend, Whitney Davis, who was on this program at a live event earlier this year, I think in January or February, when Sasha Baron Cohen was in character doing a number of these events at a conservative event. And beginning with her live kind of journalism of that event, I began getting a creeping feeling inside that there was something off, there was something amiss, and that maybe things are gotten too far and and not just that old uh, film theory that you know subsequent films or sequels are terrible but that there was something disingenuous i think you know i'm a big believer in humor and in comedy and and in pushing the limits and i think that there's a lot of room to go uh, on pro against progressives and conservatives you heard matthew and i talk about it last time but uh, i basically brought him on here so that he could cleanse our palate with better material in the <laughs> Kazakhstani tradition. So if you've ever seen Borat 1, I don't think you've seen the, the subsequent film either. Just your general thoughts maybe first and then what we can do to cleanse our, our palates. Sure. Um, I just want to sort of like preface this by saying like I'm not, and like I'm not anti Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, I think he's brilliant to be quite honest. I think he's, I think he's got a very, um, I think he's got a very capable satirical mind. Uh, I think he's got great comic timing. Um, like you said, I thought Ali G was brilliant. I thought Ali G was great. Um, and you know that 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 style of humor, particularly when uh, when sort of used in British context, worked pretty well. Uh, and I actually also watched The Dictator. Um, oh, I didn't see that one. It's okay. So it's really it's actually a pretty good film. Um, okay. It's it's a crafted comedy. Like you've got you've got sort of setups and payoffs. You've got jokes that are you know that sort of depend on uh, kind of Sasha uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's writing ability, which mm -hmm. are uh, it's like a, it's, a, it's like a directed film. It doesn't sort of depend on like the I guess the candid camera um, technique. That yeah. Borat uses and that Ali G uses and that Bruno uses. Just right. like his his acting in, I think he, I'm pretty sure he's in in Step Brothers or was it the the Ballad of Ricky Bobby, in uh, one of those films with Will Ferrell. He plays yeah. kind of like a, a foil in there, and it's it's exactly like you said. It's not it's typical acting. It's not that candid camera style. Right, and you know, like I'm unironically a fan of Muammar al Gaddafi. Gaddafi, uh, you know. God rest his soul. But um, I thought, like the I thought the satire in the dictator was utterly brilliant. Uh, I thought he did, I thought he did like a really good uh, Gaddafi impression. Uh, he thought, thought it did that pretty well. So um, and uh, yeah, I haven't seen the other film that you mentioned. Uh, the Bobby. Sorry. I think yeah, I think it's the Ballad of Ricky Bobby. Ballad of Ricky. Bobby. It's like a race okay. car movie. Yeah. Okay. And Will Ferrell, you said that. One? Yeah, yeah, Will Ferrell. Okay. Check that out. But yeah, um, I also watched Borat one. I was a little bit underwhelmed by mm -hmm. by the first Borat movie. Um, I did watch it. Um, I just think that the candid camera, the candid camera stuff, works to an extent on American victims. If you want, it just doesn't mm -hmm. work that well uh, because I think I think Americans tend to be fairly camera savvy and they tend to be fairly like 
cagey about when they're being cornered into doing something politically incorrect. Obviously, not all the time, because I mean, obviously, Borat got it hit, got hits. I just think, I just think, in a number of cases, a lot of those hits were manufactured. Yeah, like the Giuliani stuff I looked into, and right. it doesn't seem like there's anything there. Now, again, in full disclosure, I didn't watch the full movie, but I uh, watched clips uh, here and there, <laughs> and I looked this stuff, and and I have reason to be suspicious of Rudy Giuliani. Actually, he got my favorite person, Ron Paul, in the first Borat film. Oh, and yeah. so uh, Ron Paul's foil in the 2008 presidential debates was Rudy Giuliani. It's one of those big moments where I turned to, to listening to the Republican side for the first time in my life was when I saw this elderly white gentleman being against the CIA and talking about blowback for uh, you know as one of the potential causes behind 9-11. I, I was shocked that that was coming out of his mouth and Rudy Giuliani was just, he was just, uh, you know, slobbering at the mouth, yelling shibboleths, saying, I was there, I was in New York, this, that, and the third. So, you know, I'm, I'm no fan of Rudy Giuliani, but it just, the kind of gotcha moment with the, uh, you know, with the alleged uh, younger girl, it just, uh, like you said, it's contrived, it's, it's forced. Now, I've seen him get like actual statements out of people which are wild who like you said were not hip to the to the camera but a lot of the times i just wasn't i wasn't seeing that yeah. um yeah that, that, that's true and also like um I, again i watched the um trailer for borat too and uh i was a bit i was a bit disappointed by a couple of things i was a bit disappointed by the fact that he brought back the borat character uh i think that that was already kind of overdone it's like kind of an oversaturated market to a certain extent, um, and also like a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of actual Kazakhstani citizens, a bunch of actual Kazakh people, asked Sacha Baron Cohen not to revisit the character, right? And he went and he went ahead and did it anyway. And I think he did it knowingly, because there are a couple of places, even in the, even in the trailer for the subsequent movie film, where it's clear that he's playing off of certain like filmic language that. Uh, appears in, for example, White Helmer comedies and uh, Sergei Dvorsky's um, *Tulpan*, the movie *Tulpan*, which is a which is an actual Kazakh comedy, which was created in response to, partly in response to the first Borat movie. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are, um, I think that there's sort of legitimate criticisms that Sacha Baron Cohen is kind of like punching down in uh, in the subsequent movie film at his critics in Kazakhstan. Um, again, like I haven't seen the full movie, so I don't want to go too far into those criticisms, which might be a little bit like overdone. I'm just saying that I noticed those parallels. So, uh, but we're going to talk about those films today, right? We're going to, and probably a lot more, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was like a good segue. No, that's, or... yeah, that's a good, that's a good kind of, uh, general overview. So, um, we kind of, I think we we mentioned uh, last time the the Sufi philosopher that drew you to Russian Orthodoxy was yes. uh, Kazakhstani. That's right, um, and this is his book here. Uh, it's Abai's Book of Words. Um, and here's a picture of the guy himself, or at least a a painting of him. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it's the, the way that his book is structured, it's, it's structured into two parts. The first part is poetry. And then the, the second one is structured into these sort of like um, aphoristic, almost um, fragmentary, uh, philosophical kind of like, I want to call them provocations. Mm -hmm. right? so they're, they're an attempt to get the reader to, to like, like examine themselves, examine their own motivations look for the truth within. Um, and a lot of the things that he has to say, and actually a lot of things he has to say are, are uh, based in um, very careful readings of Plato, very careful readings of Plato's dialogue, except it's all one-sided, right? So he's he's trying to get you, trying, trying to goad you into sort of conversation with it. Um, but again, it's like, it's unfinished because he wants to do it from one side. Um, but yes, this is one uh, source of like my conversion to orthodoxy was was reading Abai and his his sort of deep and profound respect for the classical philosophical tradition and also the 
native religious character of the Russian people, which I thought I think a lot of people tend to either misunderstand as being analogous to American evangelicalism or mm -hmm. um, because they're Christian, like they have a certain expectation of what Christianity is. Uh, and Abba is saying, no, 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 this like learning and even philosophical inquiry are not incompatible with a Christian life or an Islamic life. Um, and Islam, it, like Muslims need to be learning from the Orthodox. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> it's like, okay, then. <laughs> I need, clearly, I need to look into this. So that's that's one of my kind of guideposts on the way. So yeah, so that was that was one of your introductions to Kazakhstan as well as Russia. Um, mm -hmm. When when did you start watching you know any Kazakhstani films? Because I'll tell you this, okay. from the Ethiopian perspective, I've watched a few Ethiopian films in my life. The older they were, the worse they were. To be honest, yeah. every year they're improving and they're getting better. But it's very hard to get me to watch like Ethiopian television or Ethiopian films by myself. If I'm with friends, I'll watch it. You know what I mean? Because it's like a group activity. But by myself, when there's so much quality stuff in English, even though, you know, I fully understand and can relate in many ways uniquely to the Ethiopian ones. I just, I don't feel that the quality is, is quite there yet. I'm wondering what could push you into the esotericism. I, I imagine you don't have any Kazakh blood in you. So I <laughs> I got to ask, how, how did you get to actually watching the films? And wh where did you kind of uh, begin? Maybe rather than the chronological order of when they were released, maybe how you encountered them would be a, a good order. Sure, absolutely. So, um, hang on a second. Um, I actually, uh, for a very, very brief period of time, for about two months, uh, I was in Peace Corps, actually. Um, I was uh, in training to be placed in uh, the south, the southeast of the country, in Kazakhstan. Um, I was based in a little village outside of Almata called Saimasai, or Alexandrevka. Um, and one of the things that I was recommended to do, actually, uh, in preparing for going into the country, was to um, go out and look for artifacts of Kazakhstani culture. Mm -hmm. Not Borat. I was, yeah. I was specifically told not Borat. Um, so, so this was after Borat. I, I didn't know the, time, the kind of time frame. Okay. It, it was, uh, like, Borat was still a thing. And it was mm -hmm. still like a cultural like touchstone. Um, so this was this was pretty far back though. So he recommended that I go to the Blockbuster. Remember those? Yeah, um, <laughs> I used to go in person every week. <laughs> and so I went down to the Blockbuster and I picked up a movie. And I, again, like I didn't know anything about Kazakhstani cinema. Uh, I didn't know anything about. Um, I didn't even really know that much about the country, even. But I went and picked up this film. Um, oh, that's not it. Ah, uh, did I bury it? This can be edited, right? <laughs> no, we like to keep it raw. Okay. <laughs> um, I went and picked up this film. Uh, Nomad. Yeah, so this is uh, Nomad the Warrior. It's, it's kind of an action blockbuster. It's, uh, it's a historical epic film, which notably the main actor in the movie is not even Kazakh. He's mm -hmm. Mexican. Wow. Neil Decker. Um, and like the, the main antagonists are also Mexican. Um, is it is it filmed in Mexico or America or something? It was filmed actually in Kazakhstan. Wow! Yeah. Listen, the like like the the main Dramani, right there. So the main character uh, Mansur is played by Becker. His his role is played by Andes, who's also a, a Mexican soap opera star. Um, the teacher of or the martial arts master is played by by Jason Scott Lee. 
of uh, Disney's The Jungle, The Jungle Book fame, right? Well, who's Chinese? I think he's either Taiwanese American or Chinese American, but um, not sure. Um, and then the villain is played by Mark Dacascos, the the uh, Philippine MMA, the Philippine MMA guy, uh, or Philippine American, I guess, MMA guy. Um, so there were a lot of like you know martial arts stars and like uh, and strangely enough Mexican soap opera stars who were uh, yeah I was gonna say what language is it it can't be in the Kazakh language right okay that's the funny part all of the actors acted in English and then they overdubbed the film with Kazakh dialogue oh wow so it it's it's pretty interesting like so so when you're watching it like jason scott lee is clearly speaking in english he's not speaking in kazakh yeah. but he overdubbed himself with kazakh dialogue um and then they redid the and then they redid the subtitles in english so yeah that could that could be done well i've i remember growing up on uh uh was it kung pao and um uh kung fu hustle and uh there was another one um something like martial arts high so kung pao, kung pao was like this ridiculous dubbed uh you know white guy lead role in a martial arts movie kung fu hustle it was chinese but it was intentionally like ridiculous uh, dubbed and then the i forget it with martial arts high or whatever the name of it was was like originally kind of normally done they remastered it with rappers as all the voices yeah. So I've I've seen those uh, growing up watching like, and reading reading manga and, and watching anime from like 2003. Uh, I probably fell off sometime in 2010, but you know I still occasionally watch. Uh, okay. I just watched The Blood of Zeus, uh, which is a, okay. a Netflix anime. Uh, pretty interesting that Netflix is coming up with its own animes nowadays. But but growing up in that culture is where you know it's Japanese material. There was always this long running debate between sub and dub. And I was always with the sub because when you have the subtitles, um, there's all these nonverbal cues that I think you miss when, when it's dubbed. It's so distracting. Uh, yeah. It's distracting to read subtitles too, but I want to say less. Uh, That's very arbitrary, subjective decision of mine, but I just feel that it's less distracting than these odd voices that just don't seem to fit. But I do remember appreciating those few films where it was ridiculous. So if this is done intentionally by the people, uh, that's interesting. Well, it, but, well, here's the thing: like, it's it's not, um, and that's part of the film's charm. So again, like the, the films, like so, Kung Fu Hustle is actually a Joe Shincho movie, we, and it's part of a genre domestically is called um, Wu Li Tao, which basically means it's, it's kind of like a nonsense humor. But like, he mm -hmm. deliberately and self consciously pokes fun at certain aspects of the kung fu film genre right yeah and joe yeah. shincher is famous for this he does he does all these like really like carefully layered comedies that are like very meta in terms of their content um but he's actually actively drawing and, and kung pao actually does the same thing where it's it's deliberately poking fun at certain like stylistic toy choices made by films that like kung fu movies that were made very early on in in the development of the genre by, for example, Bruce Lee, all right, mm -hmm. um, where they did do all of the original dialogue in Cantonese or usually in Cantonese because they were filmed largely in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, but then overdubbed in English and oftentimes with really bad English or really <laughs> misfitting English, right? Yeah. So there was there was definitely sort of an uh, an intentional poking fun at it, intentionally poking fun at itself. But the, the, the thing that made Nomad so memorable and the thing that made Nomad so awesome was that it was completely oblivious, all right? It was completely wow. oblivious to how campy it was. So um, the French actually have a term for this kind of film, like a nanar, that it's, it's so campy and it's so like genuinely campy, it's so authentically bad that it's actually good, Yeah. Right? Like um, maybe yes, uh, yes. Gremlins back in the day, exactly. Or um, uh, I'm trying to think of another one. Uh, yeah, Gremlins I can think of intentional well. ones. I can think of other intentional ones, like the Tarantino spinoffs, like Machete and Hobo with a shotgun. Robert Rodriguez and and Tarantino kind of spinoffs. 
Right, but like this one's more kind of in the in the realm in the realm of like Gremlins or The Room or um, yeah, like Hard Ticket to Hawaii, like the the ones that you sort of see mocked on Red Letter Media. But that's the kind of film. Yeah. No matter what. Like they're is. trying to be a serious film, is what you're saying in the genre. Exactly. Like Sergey Bodrov Senior, who we're going to talk about Sergey Bodrov Senior because he is a huge name in Kazakhstani cinema. Mm -hmm. um, and he should also be a like big name in cinema period because he's that like prolific and visionary a director. Um, he did have a vision for Nomad and that vision exploded spectacularly in your face on the screen. It was beautiful. Um, but like this was a huge budget film. The Kazakhstani government poured millions and millions of dollars, like even wow. like real world dollars not just like Tengi, but actually like, you know, dollar dollars into yeah. making this film. Federal Reserve notes. Right. And it was supposed to be uh, this massive epic about the founding of the Kazakh nation. All right. Abdul Mansur is probably one of the most respected names in Kazakhstani history as the man who fought for and achieved Kazakhstani independence from the... Uh, the Oirat Empire, or the Kalka Empire, or uh, the Jungar Empire, actually, is what the is what most English people call it, um, and actually formed the basis of the Kazakh state and the the basis of Kazakhstani politics and statecraft that you can still see today. For example, the the geopolitical strategy that is pursued by um, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, the president for life or recently departed president for life of Kazakhstan uh, from its independence all the way up till last year. Um, and, and are those two different time periods you're talking about? Because their right. current independence is from the Soviets, right? Correct. Um, but their, their first bid for independence was made in the 1700s. So this is contemporary mm -hmm. with um, it's about fifty years. It's about fifty years before the American Revolution. I think this is we're talking about the seventeen twenties, seventeen thirties here. Um, and the so they're contemporaries with, for example, the Qing Empire, which was responsible for the ultimate destruction and some say genocide of the Jungar state. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is Kazakhs being sort of accidentally on the right side of history, as some might say. Um, <laughs> But they, they, the reason that the, that the Qing Empire actually managed to defeat the Jungars and destroy their state was because the Jungars had been fighting this protracted war of repression against the Kazakh people, trying to destroy their language, trying to enslave them, trying to convert them from Islam to Buddhism. Um, and they were actually pretty brutal about it. Like if you read the primary documents, especially things like you know the the um, the uh, the accounts of the way Galdan treated his underlings in the Jungar Empire. It was it's pretty eye opening. Um, it so so you could say that this is a propaganda film, but not by much. Um, yeah. Well. well, that's interesting that you said the role of state money. Oh yeah. Um, what what do you think about that? Because I know you've got a political eye too, not just like a history mind the role of the state in in funding films people i would say typically believe that there's no state influence in hollywood however <laughs> with some of the movies that we've seen I, i'm just saying like the general vibe if you ask most people they probably say no nah, no nah. but what they don't understand is sometimes you know there'll be quote unquote consulting fees with mm -hmm. uh with uh, certain spooks <laughs> and right. they give their advice in the united states and so who knows, you know, who knows? I've never seen a sort of uh, accounting of that. So I don't know the exact money, but it's it's not something I hear usually in in film critiquing discussions. It's the role of, of state money. And you were saying they, they poured quite a lot of money into it. Yeah, and you can tell. Um, like the, the uh, Kazakh film is a state-run enterprise. They pour a lot of money into a lot of productions. Um, however, there are, Sort of, you can like, I mean, again, with Hollywood, it's really murky. Like a lot of people don't even inquire into the into the sources of funding. A lot of the a lot of the directors nowadays, they don't care. They're looking for, um, they're looking for massive funding to produce the next big 
splash, and they don't really care where they get it. Um, so that takes precedence over any kind of creative vision, any kind of uh, independent commentary. There are very few directors who have their own kind of independent view in the United States. I think one of them is Oliver Stone, although recently that could be questioned. Um, really? Why, why do you say that? I, uh, I, I am a fan of, of him. I've been watching his World War II stuff recently on on Netflix, and a long time ago, I saw his uh, Sur de la Frontera, and uh, I forget the name, but I'm sure I've seen one or two of his military films as well. Yeah, no, I mean Oliver Stone's great. I don't want to, I don't want to question Oliver Stone's um, like bona fides on this because he's like JFK is brilliant. Um, I got to see that one and it, Nixon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, like Oliver Stone is great. I don't, wanna, I don't want to diss Oliver Stone here, and that would just get us entirely off the track. But I'm just <laughs> okay. saying. Like, Hollywood, there's there's not really any question of like, yeah, what's the influence of the state in the in the industry? It's like it's everywhere. Um, yeah, there's a great uh, family friend of mine, Haile Garima. He's been independent and been in the the black independent filmmaking space since and theater since like the '60s. He uh, went to UCLA a number of years ago, but uh, for decades he's been uh, he has a Sankofa store in Washington D.C. And he's a professor emeritus at, at Howard, and he has, uh, you know, a Bush Mama, Eza, um, it's several kind of independent uh, films, and he's been pushing it. His son just did a a, a kind of biopic on gentrification. Uh, his name's uh, Marawi. Uh, hopefully, one day he'll get on the program too. But Marawi uh, just did a a nice little award winning Netflix uh, biopic, like I said, on gentrification and in in dc so you're right there's there's always and i would point back to robert rodriguez too yeah. uh, and to an extent tarantino um as kind of uh, independent voices even in hollywood sure yeah absolutely i'm not i'm not questioning that there are independent voices in hollywood i'm just saying that there's not this kind of uh critique of the cultural industry the way there is in kazakhstan where you can sort of very clearly see this bifurcation of mm -hmm. films that are definitely state sponsored the messaging is very clearly like <laughs> directed to the purposes of the state right so we're going to talk Nationalism. about we're going to talk about nomad right we're also going to talk about uh Mumbala. uh we're also going to talk about basically any of the films by um uh sergey uh, that you said uh he's uh, we're going to talk about the big directors in kazakhstani film um, but like Satayev's films, those are all very much like establishment films in terms of politics. Um, and then you've got this in the, there's then you've got this indie track, which tends to be very critical of the establishment film film industry. So you've got filmmakers like uh, Anurkulov, um, you've got uh, basically any of the directors that kind of cut their teeth in cut their teeth in the Kazakh new wave in the nineties, uh, who were all had their like these amazing, very like unique and stylistically brilliant filmmaking techniques and visions that kind of got lost in this glut of like Hollywood influenced blockbuster culture. Um, but they're still making these independent films, right? Even today. Um, and they and they all tend to have this very critical eye toward money. And then we're also going to talk about another director who's a favorite of mine, uh, Darijan Armabayev. Darijan Armabayev, who's, um, he's like a minimalist in the French tradition. So there's, a, there's like a kind of like a Bressonian, like, uh, he, he likes his long pregnant pauses. He likes his artsy shots. He likes, mm. to, he likes to do things in a very French way. Um, but his films are like probably the most literate films that I've seen in terms of their in terms of their connection to I mean they're, they're almost novels on screen and they're and they're beautifully done and um, his his you watch dubbed or subbed these are subbed I watch all of these movies subbed um, I did not watch any of these dubbed except for Nomad because it's awesome because you know dubbing just makes it more funny um, but this is my introduction to Kazakhstani film was Nomad the Warrior um, and again, like it's it's supposed to be this grand historical epic of like uh, Abu Lai Khan's great rise to power and his leadership of the Kazakh nation. It turns up it ends up being kind of this like boneheaded revenge story almost, where where all of the decisions made by the major characters are only possible if you consider the like 
they're deliberately being thick. So um, there's a there's definitely a kind of a um, so bad it's good quality to the film, and it, like it's 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 seriously it's entertaining. It's got amazing special effects. Like they literally made a reconstruction of the city of Turkestan and set it on fire for this film, and that must have cost <laughs> millions of dollars to do. Uh, so I don't want to spoil it too much because like go out and see. Yeah, it. I'm gonna watch this one. I'm gonna start with this one. Yeah. Um, but this was my this was kind of the this was kind of my introduction to Kazakhstani film, and then they basically kind of left it on the back burner until I was getting on to kind of like the tenth anniversary of my blog. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, okay, I saw this one Kazakhstani film a long time ago. I enjoyed it because it was so ridiculously bad, which was awesome. Um, maybe I should go and watch a couple of other films in the in this Kazakhstani film tradition. And all of a sudden, I got sucked into this entire like universe of uh like cinematic awesomeness and then of course there were another there were a couple of other films that i've watched between these two that sort of fit into the kazakhstani film universe even though i didn't realize it at the time that did have funding from kazakh film or that did have like input from the kazakhstani government Mm -hmm. or which were directed by kazakhstani directors um so the film that I watched next was this one, uh, by Kongor. It's, uh, it's a romantic comedy by Veit Helmer, who is a German director, um, and it supports an international cast, in- including Kazakhstani and French actors. Um, it is a brilliant uh, romantic comedy, very quirky and very Soviet. Um, it's it's definitely it's definitely got both kind of a critique of the Soviet Union's uh, push into space, mm-hmm. but also kind of a celebration of it, almost a nostalgic celebration of it. It is it's kind of the place where um, like fairy tales and the real world come into collision, and it's and it's set in this very kind of like. It's almost like a dream world where any, anything is possible and where like G.K. Chesterton's fairy logic uh, works its kind of magic. It's, it's, a very, it's a very beautifully done film because, um, you know, things that are improbable happen, right? So I was going to uh, say, is it like Spanish magic realism or like straight up sci-fi or fantasy rom-com? Because I've never seen a rom-com like that. That's funny. It's, it's almost it's it 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 can be like fragmented or it can it can work in any of those directions. It can be a little bit like Pan's Labyrinth, for example. Yes. Um, Great film. Yeah. Um, like the main character, like the main character is uh, is this uh, geek living out in this um, uh, owl, this traditional Kazakhstani nomadic village where everybody lives in. In every lives in yurts and moves around, except they don't make their living by herding sheep. They make their living by salvaging wreckage from Soviet spacecraft that land in the in the Kazakhstani <laughs> desert. All right. Um, so already you've got this setup, which is both kind of plausible, but also in a sense like absurd, almost almost dreamlike, almost like a fairy tale. Yeah. Um, it, you, it, uh, it, it, there's an Ethiopian artist who has been, uh, hopefully he's going to come on the show soon. His name is No. He's been painting, uh, I think he does it digitally. I don't know how he does it. It looks really great. But like these priests riding on clouds next to spaceships. Um, there was a Spanish director. Uh, man, I'm forgetting his name now. I think it's like Miguel Lienzo, who worked with so when you say german director coming in I, i'm wondering if this is kind of a, a european influence on the kazakhs the, the there's a, a a film called crumbs which is exactly the way that you described it there's like a spaceship always seen in the distance it's post-apocalyptic someone is burning incense before an image of michael jordan uh you know it's totally bananas there's a a, a black santa claus character so uh <laughs> i i know exactly what you're talking about and that that kind of genre blending 
maybe maybe it happens because you have someone who's a German director as opposed to if everyone was all Kazakhstani in the cast. That's that's an interesting mix. I always feel weird about it. Like my favorite Ethiopian movie has this like Spanish director, but he does justice to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's something very similar going on. Like, I don't know. I mean, Ethiopia is, I mean, it's, it's interesting because Ethiopia is a country where like the traditions never died. All of the all of the political structures, in, in some sense, even though even though um, Ali Selassie is gone, right? Necessarily, he's like all of his all of his reforms, all of his institutions are probably like to a large extent still in place, right? And then, of course, during yeah, they, World switched, War II, they switched hands. <laughs> they switched from uh, yeah. from from feudalism to communism to uh, federal democracy. <laughs> so, in relevant terms, right? <laughs> yeah, um, but. Uh, like um, there was a, I think there was some kind of battle during World War II where the Italian fascists were invading Ethiopia, and right. the Ethiopian army managed to ward them off by fighting in the formation of a cross. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure what the what the name of this battle was, but. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know about the particular episode, but there are a number of episodes like that. I remember reading one time at one of the battles that bees formed in the shape of the Archangel Michael. And the, the Italians saw this and just put their weapons down. They're like, we're not going to battle the Archangel Michael today. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but like, there's definitely like a similar sensibility in Kazakhstan because they also went from kind of this very traditional lifestyle, um, you know, herding sheep, living communally in owls, living uh, kind of almost this like semi-nomadic lifestyle to all of a sudden under Stalin being forced into like Soviet prefab cities mm -hmm. and having to, and having to like, be force industrialized because basically during like as World War II was approaching, um, Stalin took his entire industrial base out of the reach of the Germans. He moved it from yes. Western Russia, where most of the population is, out into the middle of nowhere, Kazakhstan, including the film industry. So a I, lot of I just learned that through Oliver Stone, by the way, not too long ago. Oh, really? <laughs> I, di I didn't know that he did that. I didn't know that that was part of the. Uh, I need more world war ii knowledge but yeah it's like a few months ago i learned that yeah it's it's crazy but that's what he did right so yeah. all he, sudden, he abandoned like, basically like belarus and ukraine pretty much yeah like that was the old industrial base and a lot of the old industrial base like for example in the ukrainian east like that's one of the key divisions between the ukrainian west which is largely agrarian and they speak uh Surgic, um only like a tiny percentage actually speak ukrainian uh, they speak Sergic, um, and they tend to look toward the West for inspiration. And then the East tend to look toward Russia for inspiration because, like, that was Russian industry, and mm -hmm. that was where the that was where you know the last, uh, like, that was where the last remaining factories in the West were still located. Um, but like, all of a sudden, like, think about what it would mean for like a Kazakh like a Kazakh person living this traditional lifestyle to all of a sudden see these massive factories just spring up out of nowhere overnight almost yeah uh, pretty and were they were they relocated the Kazakhs relocated or just it's those more Russians on the western side relocated to where they are well I mean that's a, this is kind of the tragedy of Kazakhstan there were forced relocations during Stalin's time and a lot of Kazakh people died and this has been the subject of certain films in the Kazakh in the Kazakhstani consciousness um, and there's one here uh, that we'll get to in a minute the road to mother which which takes a very almost uh, state propagandistic view of this um, we're, we're, but like um, it's an attempt to sort of build an independent Kazakhstani identity independent of the Soviets who are sort of viewed as the enemies of the traditional Kazakh way of life right mm -hmm. but like here, the, the film Baikonur is actually interesting because you see this uh, this young Kazakhstani man who is infatuated with everything to do with space. His owl is completely dependent on this on basically like salvaging old wreckage from Soviet space like spacecraft, um, and their owl is located right next to the uh, Baikonur Cosmodrome, where all of the all of the Soviet space missions went up, and they're still going up, 
right? Um, so he falls in love with this uh, TV image of a French, of a French um, like exchange student, or you know, who want who like uh, kind of like high powered, uh, very glamorous like new cosmonaut, right? Uh, she gets to she gets to go up into space because she's paid for the program and has learned how to has trained how to be an astronaut. Um, so he falls in love with almost this fairy image of his dream of becoming an astronaut, and the film kind of follows him through that. And it's it's at the same it's at the same time both kind of wistful and a little bit a little bit like um, comic because like. You know, he's this nobody, nobody bumpkin guy who falls in love with a princess and wants to go up to meet her in the stars, right? And he like it's it's kind of I don't want to spoil the ending. The ending is the ending is pretty sweet, but it's it's also kind of a bittersweet ending. Um, but this is a film that I would highly recommend just because it, it it captures so much of the kind of the unreality in a certain way, or like it, of the um, almost the the fairy tale illogic of the Soviet era. Um, but it does so in a way that it's it's nostalgic and critical at the same time. Yeah. That that's the right way. <laughs> that's <laughs> the that's the right way. Being uh archaeo futuristic. Like I well, I like, always rail against sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just saying that's precisely what this film is. It's archaeo futuristic. I didn't know that was a thing, but that's that perfectly describes what this film like oh, it's, it is. I I had an article a while back saying uh, Afro-Asiatic archaeofuturism <laughs> in terms of, and I was talking about practices, right? I was talking about um, how modern science is bearing out that longevity is aided by barefoot walking and fasting and taking cold showers, which are all three things that were seen as signs of poverty, you know, right. uh, uh, fasting, aka starving or not having enough food, uh, cold showers, aka not having hot water, uh, walking barefoot, aka not affording shoes. So these things that were seen as weaknesses are are being found to um, to be strengths, and people are are building like you know that I had a, a guy from Zero Shoes building a a shoe company based off the idea that barefoot is the best. But sometimes, because there's so many uh, artificial objects out there, your foot might be in danger. So then having minimalist shoes with minimalist support for the arc to simulate the barefoot, even acknowledging that if you know an environment is safe, the best thing for you to do is actually go barefoot, having some sort of minimalist base. And you know, you have cold showers, which everyone has access to, because that just means don't heat your water. But then you also can go to cryo, uh, cryotherapy. You know, where places right. where, you know, people pay a lot of money to get this kind of artificial breeze of cold that, uh, you know, I know for sure in Minnesota, you can you can get a nice cold shower <laughs> colder than I would get here in, uh, in California. Absolutely. And I mean, that's part of the whole sauna culture, too, which we have here in Minnesota, which basically the Finns brought over. Yep. And, you know, the sauna culture, it, whether in Russia or Finland, right, it basically involves sitting in a superheated room for, you know, half an hour or an hour at a time. Then coming out and jumping to Cold Lake. Yeah, yeah, the that ice cold. I I miss saunas, man. That's the one big thing I I miss. Uh, I used to have a twenty four gym that I used to go. I used to go two to three times a week in the sauna, man. I used to sit there, and it would always be funny to me. Uh, people who are new to it, or like you see someone recommended to them, they go in for five minutes and leave, and I'm sitting there for like 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It gets you clean, man. It gets yeah. like deep clean. No. Yeah. Oh, so many, so many things. Um, so yeah, just based off that genre alone, I'm, I'm interested. So what, what's the next movie you have for us? So, um, let's see. So there's, there's sort of several directions we can take here. Um, trying to think about kind of what we want to do. Like I could go like the big commercial blockbuster films versus indie films, or I could sort of go in kind of a chronological sequence or I could where, talk where does that last one fit? Was that also state sponsored? It had to be. It like, had to be. Yeah, and part of that, part of the reason for that was they didn't want to let any foreign uh, directors into the country after Borat mm. because they thought they were just there to make fun of them. 
Yeah. So one of the things that Weidhelmer had to do was he had to, A, petition the government to make his film in Kazakhstan, and B, he had to give the president's daughter, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev's daughter, a bit role in, one, in his film. And she's adorable, by the way. It's like, obviously, like, this is something that they had to do, but they yeah. just ran with it, and, like, she's super cute. So just, uh, spoiler alert, she's in the movie, and she's awesome. Um, that's good. Yeah. So then, so then, since we went with two state films, let's go with the an indie film. Let's go more. Let's go deeper into the critique. Okay. Um, so if we're talking indie films, we got to start talking about the Kazakh New Wave. All right. Um, so the Kazakh New Wave was basically um, it basically took off during uh, Glasnost and Perestroika in the waning years of the Soviet Union. So the, we're talking about like 1989 to 1993 was kind of the big era for uh, indie films in Kazakhstan. And um, let's see, one of the big, one of the big directors was uh, Rashid Nugmanov, and the, the single most famous uh, of the Kazakhstani new wave films was Igla, The Needle. Um, and this one is particularly famous because the main character, Viktor Tsoi, was a huge rock star in Russia, like a literal rock star. Um, his music was, it's, it's kind of like the Beatles in... in uh, like before he was an actor or simultaneous? He's like rock star and movie. actor? Like he wrote the soundtrack to this movie. Wow. And shortly after this movie, he pulled a James Dean and died in a car accident, right? So mm. he instantly became almost like a sainted figure mm. among post-Soviet youth, especially, who kind of rebelled against uh, basically the kind of the official corruption, authoritarianism, uh, you know the whole the whole kind of vacuity of state-sponsored culture, right? And and Igla, this film also kind of skewers the pretensions of Soviet, um, both of Soviet like television, and also of the coming like, um, I guess the coming decay of everything related to everything related to the Soviet state and how easy it was to just sort of push that whole facade over. And it takes the, it takes the, um, it, it, it takes the struggle of this uh, rebellious, like rootless youth uh, who's played by Victor Tsoi. He's, he's a, he's a chain smoking black jacket wearing long haired ruffian, it, you know, sort of like a, it, almost like a Byronic figure, right? And he's trying to save his ex-girlfriend from being a heroin junkie. So um, he's he's fighting off both like the police, he's fighting off organized crime, he's fighting basically all of the all of the figures that represent the establishment. And, and, his, and his struggle is actually kind of narrated in a postmodern way by these like old Soviet TV advertisements, which <laughs> act as kind of like a Greek chorus. It's it's actually pretty brilliantly set up. It's very psychedelic because obviously it's dealing with like heroin withdrawal that's that's represented yeah. filmically with this very like uh, psychedelic um, film language, uh, which seems so. to be cyclical because we've got our our own opiate opioid crisis in the United States nowadays. Oh so that's infinitely relatable. If you say he's also critiquing the police, it that's you gotta love the films that have these these timeless elements to them. Oh yeah, like this is this is a movie that could air today and still seem relevant, honestly. It could air it could air in modern Russia and still seem relevant. Um and that's one of the things about Victor Soy is like his cult status has has endured into in a lot of the culture. His songs are like um again, they have the same kind of cultural cachet for Russians as like um any of the Beatles songs, right? Um and, and he sings in uh, the Kazakhstani language or in Russian. He is, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about another film on my list. I don't have it here on DVD format. It's actually on the Criterion Collection because mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese actually considered it an influence on him. Nice. Um, we're going to talk about the film Revenge. So Victor Tsoi is a Soviet Korean. Mm -hmm. I think his, I think either is I think he is like half Russian, half Korean. One of his parents was Korean. Yeah. And 
the experience of Korean people in the Soviet Union, in Russia, was one of uh, almost kind of a failure to belong. And that really kind of drove a lot of his rebel persona, right? So he's got, he's got this, he's a, Soviet, he's a Soviet rock star, so he's anti-establishment in one way. He also belongs to this um, ethnic group that doesn't really fit in anywhere. Like he's not North Korean, he's not South Korean. He is the descendant of Korean workers in the in the Russian Far East, um, who were sort of culturally despised as other by the Soviets, even though that was against the ideology. So it was basically kind of like they didn't exist. Yeah. Right? Did they so, did they retain their like Korean language and I don't know? Did they practice Taekwondo and Hapkido? Like, did they have elements of Korean culture? We're going to talk about that. So uh, the the film Revenge deals with the plight of Soviet Koreans and their their kind of struggle to hold on to a lot of these like cultural elements, like Taekwondo or um, uh, Buddhism or the Taoist, or basically like the the Korean worldview entire. It didn't transplant very well into into Soviet times, and so the Koreans felt themselves to be. Um, like you know, a washed-up pebble that doesn't fit in. They they feel like they're they're rootless and their existence doesn't have any meaning. The the oh my gosh, the film revenge again. It's the the film mist, which is a which is made by Soviet Koreans, deals with deals explicitly with a lot of these elements, and so you see these themes in the, in the film revenge. It's it's a basically like it's a kung fu story, right? But it's set in the Korean. It's, it's set among the Korean community in the Soviet Union. All right, and so basically, it follows this. Um, it's a tale of two families. There's the um, there's the Chai family and the An family, and the there's a a school teacher named An who who kills this little girl during a during an outburst in the middle of a school lesson for not paying attention. And this girl belongs to the Chai family, and her father vows revenge against the school teacher. Um, and his like his wife dies because her his wife dies in grief. Right, he remarries a woman who does not speak. This is again, this is like the the speechlessness is a theme that recurs throughout this film. She gives birth to a boy who's tasked with seeking revenge against the school teacher An for a sister that he never knew that he never lived to see. He learned about it when he was a youth. Before then, he actually wrote traditional Korean poetry. And then all of a sudden, he was told by his father, this man killed your sister. You have to claim revenge upon him. Avenge my blood. And he stopped writing poetry. He said, poetry is useless to me now. Even though he had the talent for it, he could no longer write poetry. And moreover, there was a, there was a curse on his family. Like the, the, the Ans left this curse on his family that left all of the men infertile after a certain time. So he was the last of his line. And it turned out that he had inherited the curse. His, his balls don't work. So even though this, this Romanian who is on the same, this Romanian cook who is on the same work uh, unit as he is, falls in love with him, like clearly wants to get in his pants, right? Uh, absolutely, like, uh, absolutely adores him goes to sleep with him and it turns out like he's bleeding. There's no way that they can consummate. And it's like, it's a, it's a tragic, it's like this tragic scene. And you know, it's the idea of rootlessness, of fatherlessness, of futurelessness just goes throughout this film, uh, following the story of revenge. And like, even the end, like when he's, when he finds that school teacher Anne is long since dead, he is actually the victim of an accident because he was so paranoid that the Chai, lineage was going to kill him um it, it almost makes for sort of like this karmic cycle that he's trying to escape from but he like again he doesn't really fit in in any place so he's again like i don't i don't want to spoil too much about this film it is a brilliant film but it does explore kind of the both the aspirations of the soviet koreans and their inability to sort of put those into any kind of meaningful context in the soviet world Right, so there are Koreans who still live in Russia, who whose families have basically lived in Russia for you know hundreds of years, 
Mm -hmm. right? Like the but, kind of Afrikaners in South Africa. Well, yeah, I mean, they were basically there as kind of like a free labor force or a very cheap labor force. Um, but uh, like, it's really only been with the Russian Federation that these people have had any kind of official recognition whatsoever. And the fact that actually films like Revenge were made was actually kind of an affirmation of who they were and, that the, and the fact that they were actually a people. So again, I, I'm recommending these films and talking about them in these like really extravagant phrases. They really are beautiful films. Both yeah, no, are, this is this is a solid, it's a solid list. And I don't know if I had mentioned it last time, kind of when you were telling me about the Kazakhstani people being this kind of general mix, uh, you know, being from the Eurasian. Is the word pronounced step or steep? I've seen step, it written. Yeah. Yeah, from the Eurasian step, uh, I spent five and a half years learning Taekwondo. You know, you know, uh, you know, bowing before the Korean flag and counting yeah. up to ten uh, as we would strike in Korean. I wish I could remember. I just remember Yasit, Tasit, Fasit was like those are like a couple. That was like six and seven. Uh, I remember they they rhymed in Yup Step, uh, Ibo Chunjin, Ibo Hujin. We had names for the kind of the moves that we were doing. Uh, we had a uh, two uh, white Jewish teachers, uh, the main one who was a black belt under our Korean master. And our Korean master, he would visit us like once a, a month and he was this legendary guy. You know, we would come hit the heavy bag. he come and when he hits the heavy bag, it breaks, you know. he's <laughs> So yeah. I, I, I grew up in, in kind of that environment from ages 9 to 14. Um, so I have a, a deep appreciation for uh, always that uh, the Korean people. And then I read uh, Michael Malice's book on North Korea, the the unauthorized biography of uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, excuse me, Kim Jong-il. Uh, so <laughs> I've gotten a taste of it, but I, I didn't realize there was such a big presence within Soviet Russia. And with the ideals of, of communism being this kind of globalist, internationalist movement that's supposed to uh, wash away all the differences between humanity, going back to some of the motifs you are covering in the other images, it shows how you can't quite do that. Or if you can, you, you can't do it overnight. It's got to take much longer for the, the beijing of the, of the world, you know, the melting pot people talk about in, in the United States to actually happen. And the interim, you have actual people's actual cultures which are are being formally repressed by the state. So it's good, it's good to see that there is art giving voice to those people. Cause I would have never known of that if you, if you didn't tell me. Yeah, and like the one of the one of the big tragedies, and actually we can talk about this at a later time. Uh, it doesn't involve the Cossack people, but the Cossack people are related to it, right? Is the is the some of the Eastern Siberian peoples who were first reached during the 17 and 1800s and who converted to Orthodoxy. Um, their traditional way of life was something very close to communism. And when the Russian, when the Russian revolution happened and they sent commissars into the countryside to, to sort of convert the, convert the Evenki people to communism, they basically said, wait, this is what we do anyway. We share everything <laughs> anyway. We, we keep all of our tools in the same place. Anybody can use them. We, you know, we share the herds. It doesn't make sense to divide up the herds when there are so limited resources around here, you you, you kind of have to pull to you have to pull your resources to survive here. Yeah, All right. I guess that's a, a difference between like a, a managerial state sponsored communism and a more bottom up uh, communism. Well, yeah, it's like it's the it's the way that people live in order to survive. And when communism was explained to them, it's like okay, this makes sense, right? Um, and the fact was that the Soviets didn't try to cheat them at first. They 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 were offering their um, they were offering basic survival goods like tea, sugar, ammunition, gunpowder at basically bulk rate prices to these people where they had basically been gouged for years by the Cossacks under the czars, right? Um, and they thought, okay, this is a pretty sweet deal for us. But then Stalin came in and started collectivize, collectivizing them because they were already collectives. He wanted mm -hmm. them to become sedentary industrial workers, right? And, and you know, they died. Yeah. Like, the, the population of the Evenkis reduced from 50,000 to 30,000 people in the space of 20 years. And like, there's no record of this. It's, it's all like oral. There's no, there was no like, you know, truth and reconciliation commission to figure out what happened. Even it was just like one day you're there and the next day you disappeared. Right. 
Um, and it's a terrible tragedy. Like it, it, it decimated their communities. Um, so, but at the same time, right, the neoliberalism happened after Perestroika, and you know the Soviet Union collapsed, and and capitalism came in and basically cut the entire traditional economy out from under them. Even though they said they were being liberated, they were being liberated into a system that they didn't understand and had no access to, and they continued to starve. So, like they've been kind of doubly screwed over by both capitalism and communism from either side. It was, uh, so again, this is like one of those untold stories, but. Um, and it's something that I could also go on at like hour long length about, but uh, <laughs> we've got some more films to get to here. So I don't want to spend too much yeah, time on Yeah, no, that's long. good. Cause the only time I'd ever really hear about Siberia before is either, you know, a Siberian tiger at a show in Vegas or, or Siberia I had heard was some of the places people were getting sent for the work camps during that time as well. Actually that, that segues us very nicely into the next film that I'm going to tell you about, which is Runaways. Um, this is actually set during the waning years of the Tsarist Russian period um, mm -hmm. in Siberia. And the main and like one of the supporting characters belongs to the Evenki people that I just mentioned. Um, and he actually he's actually kind of the voice of conscience in this film, which is kind of interesting. This is also a Kazakhstani film. It was it was funded, I think, by Kazakh by Kazakh film. Um, and the director Unfortunately, the director, uh, Rustam Mosafir, did not like this film, did everything possible to kind of like um, de-advertise it, I, I guess, oh. kind of almost disown it, which is a shame because it's a brilliant film. It's beautifully shot, um, but it didn't really match up with the artistic vision that he wanted to present. And he made a, he made a more recent film in 2018 called The Scythian or The Scythian. Yeah. which is about this group of Iranian um, nomads that basically got culturally assimilated into the Russian empire under the Kievan Rus, right? And which um, any student of the Bible should learn because there is the famous uh, passage and people are always like, uh, even the Scythian, and, and it says even the Scythian, yeah. there, are no, there are no differences between people and, and the Scythian is, is mentioned. And uh, a lot of people don't know what the hell that, that, that means. Well, I mean, the, the, to put it bluntly, the Scythians were these, you know, hemp smoking, Sama drinking, horseback riding bandits who were just all around general badasses. Um, and they spoke a language that was uh, in the Iranian language family. Uh, mm -hmm. So Persian, Tajik, uh, Dari, Pashto. Um, they spoke a language that was very similar to that. And actually the modern Ossetians claim to be the descendants of the Scythian people. Um, they were they kind of launched themselves into prominence with the 2008 South Ossetia War between between the Ossetian people and uh, the state of Georgia, um, but they but that's that's who this that's who the modern day Scythians are the Ossetian people, um, but anyway uh, so so Rustam Mosafir's first film Begletsi, or The Runaways, it's about this uh, this democratic political activist during the um, during the late Soviet or no late Tsarist time. Who tried to assassinate somebody high up, probably the emperor or one of his uh, advisors, right? And he got exiled out to Siberia, and he's basically um, it's it's basically his story of kind of atonement and redemption in a way, um, because he's tasked with caring for the widow, who's a deaf mute, of a uh, of a Russian prospector that lived out there. Um, and basically protecting her from these, uh, you know, czarist secret police who turn out to be just these completely unprincipled, like, headhunters, literally. Like, they would go out and they would kill runaways, and they would go out and, and they wouldn't necessarily be too careful about who they killed. Um, so his job is basically to, not just to survive, but also to protect her. And they end up having to take the help of this Evenki shaman, who basically appears as, as kind of the voice of this character's conscience, basically saying, well, why are you really out here? Is this, are you doing this for her? Are you doing this for yourself? Are you looking for God or are you looking for gold? Right. <laughs> and that's one of the, that's one of the main, actually, that's one of the main kind of ironies of this film is that everybody is very religious, including the headhunters. Right. But eventually the headhunters turn on each other. They don't trust each other um, because they want a bigger share of the bounty at the end. 
and there's a there's kind of a subplot that goes along with well where's this russian prospector's gold cash in right uh was this guy loaded and does this girl know where it is and can she tell us right so there's definitely kind of like this western outlook so that's another genre that we can talk about is the austern basically the russian western right mm -hmm. um and that's basically what this film was trying to be it was kind of like a russian answer to the western and in, in that kind of tradition which actually goes back to soviet times um so that that's runaways um we can also talk a little bit about Rustam Mosafir's uh, The Scythian, which is which is another one of these films that deals with kind of the erasure of cultural identity. But Mosafir's artistic vision draws less from native Russian sources than it does from like genre genre filmmakers in the West, like um, like Quentin Tarantino. Or yeah. um, uh, let's do that. Let's let's go into the the Scythian. I'll, I'll correct my pronunciation there <laughs> and uh, let, let's, let's close on that one because I like the fact that anytime there's a point, what I always tell people when studying the Bible, cause that's a big part of my, my other audio podcast is you have to read the text as much as possible. Learn the original languages. If you're not going to learn the original languages, which is right, biblical, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, then the least you can do is learn the historical context. Because again, I don't care even if you know the original language, if you don't know what a, what a Scythian is, you're not, you're not going to know the significance and the weightiness, the substantiveness of what's going on. So we will, uh, we will couch this in terms of you are giving people biblical background knowledge. <laughs> on Bikio represent, I love it. It's the, it's the Antiochian school of catechesis. I, it's great. <laughs> we were learning biblical Hebrew. We're learning Koine Greek, and we're learning Aramaic because we want to be able to access the historical frame of the original authors of the text. Right? This is pure. This is pure Paltarazi. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that that is my rabbi. <laughs> he, is, he is awesome. He is he is he is brilliant. Um, yeah. And like I like like again like I'm still trying to learn Arabic, and I'm also trying to learn Biblical Hebrew so that I can actually go to like the BHS and actually say, oh. This is what they were actually talking about, right? Um, <laughs> right. I, I'm behind. I know random words of Arabic, especially the the cognates with my own language. I made a list one time of like 50 words that I knew with a Jordanian friend, a Moroccan friend, and a Kuwaiti friend. And, uh, you know, obviously the Moroccan friend has got a lot of French in his talk too. But uh, it, it was great to make a list of, of cognates, but that doesn't help you with conjugation and reading. And then there's the formal, you know, the literary Arabic versus the the kind of many dialects all over the place. So I'm focusing on uh, my Hebrew and Giz now. My betrothed speaks Tigrinya, so I've been picking up conversational Tigrinya. So those are three <laughs> Semitic languages I've been working on this year. And uh, yeah, yeah. frankly, that's enough for now. <laughs> Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, okay, so we we discussed um, Nomad the Warrior. Uh, yes. We discussed the we discussed Weithelmer comedies. I actually have another one here that's not technically Kazakhstani. We can sort of skip that one. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't discussed uh, Sergei Dortsevoy yet, which is a shame. We haven't discussed no. the um, Darajan Omar Bios films yet, which is also I wanted to get to those as well. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly a little bit more on like the establishment films. Go, okay, um, so go the, go into the establishment ones and then close with the the Scythian. Uh, yeah, we could do we could do something like that. But like, so this is kind of my representative of like the um, blockbuster. Oh, there's step. It's uh, there's step in the name there. Yep. <laughs> I said that so earlier. The, the English translation is Warriors of the Step, but like the the original Kazakh title is. Uh, uh Mimbala, which means the thousand warriors. Um, and this is also like it's a it's there's kind of a there's kind of an interesting rivalry going on between um this film director, Akan Satayev, and um uh Sergei Bodrov Sr., who directed uh Nomad the Nomad. Warrior. Yeah. Film, these films kind of treat the same subject matter, but they were filmed about like I want to say like three or four years apart. Um mm -hmm. This is a much more competent film, just in terms of like how it, in terms of its subject matter, treats it much more seriously. The production effects are much more advanced. The special effects are much more advanced. The, the fight choreography is sterling, 
and everybody is speaking in Kazakh. So there, it's using mm -hmm. Pakistani um, uh, acting school graduates or acting school students. This is another. This is another. Um, another thing that Kazakhstani film does well is it. It really makes use of um, amateur talent in a way that American films don't. So. Like for example, Sergei Bodov Sr., he cast a whole bunch of people who had who were veterans of acting, either in Mexico or in the Philippines or in the United States, Jason Scott Lee, Kunal Becker, Jay Hernandez. Um, Kazakhstani film directors tend to look for uh, amateurs because they feel that that gives them a much more authentic feeling, places them in a much more authentic way. It, so it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like it's uh, like um, it doesn't feel like it's an art artificial acting. Uh, so I'm glad uh, you said that because I my more cynical side would have probably said it's a budgetary concern. Well, I mean, it, at least in some cases it was, especially with like the new wave like artists because they couldn't afford they couldn't afford getting like uh, big name actors. They ended up going to acting schools, right? Uh, to, to staff their films. Um, and that was definitely like a budgetary concern. Uh, but uh, Warriors of the Step, I mean, this, th there was no budgetary constraint on this one, but he still went for the, for the like amateur film, uh, the, the amateur uh, actors. And it follows much the same beats, including the, including the themes of like kidnapping, betrayal, um, honor, glory, um, and like step ethics. Like hospitality, that uh, that Nomad the Warrior does. But the thing that underlies both of these films, both Nomad the Warrior and Warriors of the Steppe, is the Turk the Turkic Dastanic tradition, which is under underscored by the epic of, for example, Al Um So this is my this is my very tattered, very worn copy of Al um, who was kind of the He's kind of the typical Kazakh hero, right? And when I say typical Kazakh hero, I mean somebody who honors the steppe traditions, who shows hospitality to strangers, who is uh, very honest, very open, um, who keeps his word that's very important, who is loyal to his horse, who's loyal to his woman, he's a good lover, that's always very important, um, and he is undefeated in battle, all right? This character, in the Dastanic epic, the Batar, the hero, is the foundational character in any kind of Turkic state propaganda. Any kind of Turkic state propaganda because this is the national myth embodied. This is who the Turkic people are. They are the fiercest warriors, the best lovers, their word is gold, and they honor people no matter where they come from. So, and they that, also- That's so funny you said uh, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi earlier because he, has, he hasn't ever said it about the steppe people in general, but he specifically by name always names the Mongols because his son has traveled throughout Eurasia as mm -hmm. peoples who are, he calls them biblical people who weren't biblical people. Uh, mm -hmm. He basically says the the, Every time you hear in the Bible talk of the desert and the wilderness, he said, think of the Mongolians. And he, he mentioned two of the things you just said, the nomadism, the actually three of the things, the nomadism, the word as gold and the hospitality above all else, the biggest kind of, um, you know, uh, some people get too much into it, but the big sin of Sodom, right. Is not like big sodomy is lack yeah. of hospitality. Is lack of hospitality. Uh, some people look too much into yeah. that, but that's a, that's, that's big. Ezekiel, when he mentions Sodom, it's for yeah. their lack of hospitality. Yes. And you can definitely see that scriptural intent, that, that scriptural consciousness. Because remember, the, the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews, they all share the same foundational text. And this is something that Father, Father Tarazi points out all the time. He says, oh, the son of Abraham, that was not Isaac. Isaac was not the son of Abraham. Ishmael was the son of Abraham. Isaac was the son of God because he was a gift from God to Sarah, right? Um, but Al-Bamish, at least the version that I have, 
was transcribed not by a Sunni Muslim but by a Shia Muslim. And interesting. The, it's very it is very interesting because there are all of these references to the Battle of Karbala, to the sacrifice, the self-sacrifice of Hussein ibn Ali. And the main character, when he is weak, when he is wounded, when he is at the mercy of his enemies, when he is captured, he calls upon the name of Ali. He calls upon the name of the great, the great hero who comes to the aid of the weak, to the aid of the hopeless, right? So there's this, there's this sense of, there's this very deep sense of scriptural piety, which is shared across the great Abrahamic traditions, which finds its way into al -Pamish. And it's from this basis, actually, that you see the construction of the characters in film of, for example, Abilai Khan or um, Saktai in uh, Warriors of the Steppe. These people are the flame bearers. These are the weapon bearers who uphold the biblical virtues, like you said, of hospitality to the stranger, of honoring your word of honoring the written word, the unspoken law of the step. And um, what was the third one? Hospitality. No, uh, being a nomad. And yes, the kind of the, the um, yeah, being on the land without exploiting the land, the idea of the nomad. That's right. Yeah, like a certain um, detachment. Like Tarazi, Father Paul Denadim Tarazi always mentions. Uh, I mean, it goes back to, to Cain even, but if you look at Cain and, and his children, you know, you have Enoch, the son of Cain, then you have Enoch, the son of Jared. So the, the first thing that Cain and his children do is they build cities and build walls and build civilizations, yeah. which is kind of the route to the Tower of Babel. It's you, you become more cocky and you think of yourself as more independent. But when you're a nomad, you know that your kind of daily bread or daily sustenance is uh, not yours, but, you know, to, to lady luck or fate or God, or who you're, you know, you're in the hands of something greater than you. Exactly. And one of the things that father Paul talks about, that father Paul Tarazi talks about is the very root word of Ibrahim, the, the Hebrew, the meaning of what it is to be a Hebrew is to live across from, right? The, the root means across from. And that means you don't belong to the land you live in. You are a stranger. Your, your parents were strangers in Egypt. This is why you must be hospitable to strangers in your own land, which, it, by the way, is not a land that you own. It is a common world which you share, right? Um, and yes, that same ethic undergirds the Dastanic ethic, which is actually what makes it ironic that it is being used for these propaganda purposes to build up a sense of Kazakh national identity. <laughs> that this is our land, this is our territory, right? So already we can see the you know the devil making his way in through eisegesis, not exegesis, eisegesis of the Dastanic epic. All right, and also by the way, uh, I would say that this is the cardinal sin of this um, commenter on the Alpamish epic, H. B. Paxoy, because he is talking about this in the framework of. Turkish nationalism, not of biblical scripture, not of Muslim interpretation as the original transcriber of this epic intended. So I, I can go on at length about this, but we're talking about Kazakhstani film. We're not talking about <laughs> we're not talking about the Antiochian school of exegesis, right? It's a good it's a good aside though. We'll always sneak it in. Absolutely. The, uh, there's there's the, no wrong. The Aksumite school is very weird because we received our episcopacy from Alexandria, ah. but we received our biblical training from Greco Syrian monks. Mm, that's at that's in multiple point. periods. It, it was Alexandria that killed Saint John Chrysostom, as uh, as uh, Tarazi would say. It's it it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. 
It's true. I I I grew up, you know, a stalwart uh, Cyrillian for his uh, great Miaphysite formula that we like to quote in our battles with you Diophysites. Uh, but uh, I I ultimately realized, uh, hey, this Cyril of Alexandria guy had some beef. Him and his uncle had some beef with John Chrysostom. And if I had to choose between the saints, I'm picking Chrysostom. Yeah, absolutely. As Tarazi would say, Plato is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Something, something I took oh, too long to comprehend myself. So, you know, you're already two steps ahead of me. All right. <laughs> um, so actually, I did also want to talk about, so I did talk a little bit about Sergei Bodrov Sr. Now, Sergei Bodrov Sr. is um, very famous. He's the one that Russia. did a Nomad the Warrior. Yeah, he's the one who did Nomad the Warrior. He also did a number of other films, including one of my favorite Kazakhstani films, which unfortunately I do not have on DVD. Um, Prisoner, Prisoner of the Caucasus, which is actually a novel adaptation of a s short story by the same name uh, from Lev Tolstoy. It is an adaptation of a short story by Lev Tolstoy. Um, who, uh, so actually Sergei Bodrov Sr. actually cast in the lead role his own son, uh, Sergei Bodrov Jr., you know, God rest his soul. Uh, who actually died in a filming accident while he was in the mountains. Uh, wow. Very tragic. Uh, you mentioned someone tragic. else who who died that way earlier too. Is this a kind of a common thing? Well, I mean, this is, you know, this is post-Soviet Russia. There were, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, people that go out into and filmed on location didn't necessarily have access to medical uh, facilities. And like, it was, it was a long time before they even realized that an accident happened. So by the time yeah. that they went there, like, all 150 members of the crew film were dead. Um, yeah. Wow. Dead. And and you don't think it was anything nefarious, right? No, it was a it was a it was a rock slide. I think they were killed in a rock slide. They just you know just buried the entire camp. There was nothing. There was nothing like nothing remotely like foul play about it. Um, but uh, Sergei Bodrov Senior, of course, he's still he's still active. He's still making films. One of the films that he produced was a was the film Mongol. Which was a major like epic about the life of Chinggis Khan um, and his rise to power, and it's very interesting that we talked about this tradition of nomadic reliance on God, right? Because this is like the the religious side of the uh, life of Chinggis Khan is something that fascinated Sergei Bodrov Senior, and he was there drawing upon the secret history of the Mongols and the uh, um, the whole tradition of like, you know, the step reliance on hospitality and not knowing where your next meal is coming from and not knowing necessarily, like, you're, you're literally kind of in the hand of God. Right? And, you know, this is, you know, inherent to the story of Chinggis Khan because he's always being captured and he's always being, you know, enslaved. And it's up to, it's basically up to God to save him. And he saved him largely through the actions of his wife, Forte, or, uh, you know, his children. So, um, but the good thing about which he had Bodrov, he had many of oh yes he had quite a few of those yes um, very, very very prodigious yes but like one of the great things about Sergei Bodrov senior is that he um he he lends his talent freely in order to prop up other directors and one of those directors is uh Gulshad Amarova uh, a, a female director who actually directed the sequel, kind of the spiritual sequel to um, the Brat films, the brother films, uh, which are like the the quintessential Russian gangster films. And they, they were actually the films that turned me into a Russophile, actually. I watched them when I was in college in 2009, 2010 first. Um, but this is one of her films. Uh, it's the, the English name is uh, Shiza, or Schizo, because the main character is kind of like, well, this is actually, even though the director is Kazakhstani, this is a very Russian film. Mm. And it also kind of borrows kind of on the Russian fairy tale logic. It's also a gangster film because, you know, the main character, he's a 14-year-old kid who gets in too deep by, you know, uh, you know, fixing boxing, boxing matches and, like, um, getting too involved in the, you know, seedy, greedy capitalist side of, you know, post-Soviet capitalism. And... Uh, ending up basically committing a murder uh and like he has kind of that arc of like 
descent into crime, but then redemption because you know the um, the family that kind of adopts him uh, turns out to be kind of his like his saving grace. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a Dostoevsky tale, although the person who the the main film director who really does Kazakhs who really does like Dostoevsky well is like another one of these independent filmers, Darajan Omerbaev. This is a guy who understands Dostoevsky, all right? And he actually he actually wrote a film. Okay, so here I've got two of his early films, Kairat and Cardiogramma, which are very heavily influenced by the French uh, minimalist tradition. They're basically the same story, but it's basically a story of a, kind of a boy who falls in love, kind of gets his heart broken, and tries to learn how to be sort of independent on his own terms. It's a, like, these are bittersweet films. Kind of tear jerkers, but you know they're they're still worth watching, even though they're a little bit slow. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the French minimalist influence earlier. Was there any sort of uh, French military presence there ever, or was this just kind of an organic homage? Um, this is like a guy who is steeped in film theory. Now, it's one of those things about Soviet and post-Soviet directors is that they were trained in the theory of film in such a way that their artistic vision was never really clouded by, you know, basically what made money last, right? Um, and Darjan Omerbaev, like all of the films that he has done, whether it's Kairat or Cardiogram or Killer or The Student, um, or I think he has another one that was based on uh, Anna Karenina, I'm not sure about the name of that, but like he's he he's recently moved into making these adaptations of great Russian literature. But student, the student was actually his adaptation of Crime and Punishment, and it is it follows the story of Crime and Punishment almost perfectly, including the cat and mouse game between the student and the police who eventually he confesses to. Um, and instead of falling in love with a fallen with a you know with the the prostitute with the heart of gold right uh like in like in the original book here um the woman that the student falls in love with is a deaf mute she cannot communicate anything to him she's mm -hmm. stuck caring for her parents who are always yelling at her or who are yelling at each other in what is clearly kind of an unhappy household right um but she even though she doesn't say a word, she's kind of clearly this student's conscience, right? And she is clearly this, this student's like path back to God. And by the way, there, there is an explicit reference in the student to Abai Kunanbaev, because there because with, during the confession scene, that famous confession scene when uh, Raskolnikov is reading the Bible together with Sonia, right? And he's coming to the point where you know he's making this confession of his sin as murder to Sonia, who goes and urges him to confess to the police. The student in, da, in Darjan Omerbaev's version of this, Darmer, uh, Darjan Omerbaev's Raskolnikov, he makes his confession to Sonia underneath this huge poster of Abai Konanbaev. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Like that whole scene is just, it's perfect. I love it. But there's this entire filmic grammar to Kazakhstani films that, that allows them to access a lot of these more poignant moments in written literature that I think that American films don't necessarily, like, we don't necessarily do that very well. Like, even though we make adaptations of books, we do Harry Potter, we do, like, Twilight, we do, um, I don't know, we do Little Women, right? Watch, Watchmen... I think is the only film adaptation I've ever seen that has been super accurate. I remember yeah. reading the fifth Harry Potter book for a second time prior to watching the movie and it was the worst decision I could have ever made because the movie utterly disappointed me. Whereas the <laughs> other ones, I kind of just read it like years earlier so that I wasn't that disappointed by the film. But when I read it side by side with watching it, it very much disappointed me. Watchmen, I would say, was a very, the film, very uh, faithful yeah. adaptation. And I like the TV show too, but you know that's a whole different story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, like, I don't know why, but um, yeah, like, 
for, for some reason, like we, we tend to separate, and I think that there's like a, there must be some reason for it. I think that we tend to separate the idea of literature from the idea of film. Um, and this is something that goes back to, you know, Roger Ebert, that there's a different language that applies to film and a different language that applies to literature and never the twain shall meet. Um, I'm not sure where that sort of comes in, but like some of the films like I, that I've seen of of these Kazakhstan directors, they do these fascinating, they're not necessarily like perfectly faithful adaptations of uh -huh. like of a, of a great work of art. Like, you know, um, again, like the Darjan Omerbaev's version of Crime and Punishment takes place in the modern day, right? So he's not... You know, he's like Raskolnikov is not going into the apartment of the pawn store broker, or the, you know, pawn store owner and shooting her and her sister. Right. He's going into um, he's going into a convenience store and he's shooting a he's shooting a convenience store clerk who's watching a film about the Kennedy assassination. So there's this interesting, like intertextual, like. Critique of television and critique of like. Um, popular culture that runs through Darjan Omerbaev's films that's not necessarily present in Fyodor Dostoevsky, but it's very faithful to the spirit of Fyodor Dostoevsky, if you understand what I mean. So it's not like a beat for beat like adaptation, but it's very faithful to the to the source material in in a in a spiritual way. Yeah, I wish I remembered the names off the top of my head, but. Uh... I remember in, in when I was in college, actually around the same time as you, we might be the same age, uh, the Akira Kurosawa uh, Shakespeare adaptations to the samurai genre. Ah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yes. Like there's a Macbeth, there's a, you know, King Lear. I mean, you just, you see it all in, in samurai version and the samurai version is way more epic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, like, it's a good thing you mentioned Akira Kurosawa because like, even Akira Kurosawa kind of cut his teeth, teeth on Soviet film with his film about Dersu Uzala, which was the, which was kind of like the, um, like the. Was Robinson that the gangster? Uzo. Was it? Was, Sorry, oh, okay, okay. Well, it, I was asking like, if it was a gangster film. It's, no, it's not a gangster film. It's a, it's kind of like a nature survival film, and it, and it's set in the eastern part of Siberia, and it's and the the main character Dersu Uzala is a hudren. Uh, trapper and hunter he's got this very close connection with nature and he's just this very decent human being and the film's this kind of like exploration of survival and an exploration of of like what it means to be a decent human being even in a place where human survival is difficult um and it's like it, it's like a it's an epic length movie it's like three hours long but it is very much worth watching and if you're a star wars fan it is doubly worth watching because so much of the filmic language that George Lucas used, you can see it in Dersu Uzala, including like the hot scene with the blizzard and they're cutting open the tauntaun, right? Uh, that came out of the blizzard survival scene in Dersu Uzala. The scene with the two suns of tattooing coming up and Luke looking out over the horizon at the two suns, that also came from Dersu Uzala when uh, Vladimir Arseniev is sitting with their Uzala and they're looking at the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time. And then like a lot of the scenes in Endor actually take a lot of their palette and take a lot of their spiritual grounding in the scenes that were like their Uzala and Vladimir Arseniev are tracking the Siberian tiger through the, through the forests of Siberia. Very, very interesting, like parallels to what George Lucas was doing with the Star Wars trilogy. But. Yeah, it's it's so great to see those underlying things. I remember years ago, um, you know, before his uh, campaign for presidency, Kanye West, uh, before his rap career, he was yeah. a phenomenal producer. And the thing that used to always make him different than a lot of other producers is the extent to which he he took very seriously the generation of black musicians in the decades preceding him and he really delved into their catalogs and so occasionally you know my father played the uh, radio station called 94 7 the wave it was a smooth jazz station here in los angeles they used to say the smoothest place on the radio uh <laughs> and i would hear songs that kanye sampled and i'd be like oh this is the original and so yeah. uh like you said if you're a fan of george lucas 
seeing the the Soviet film influence in even uh, in the Japanese film market of his influences gives, I think, a, a greater depth, like we were saying earlier, kind of background knowledge, historical context is so critical to to highlighting things. It makes things uh, pop up more. Like the first time someone told me, because I was a huge, like I said, manga guy, anime guy, Japanophile in general, that Darth Vader, who, you know, I had those films since I was a baby, uh, his hel helmet is based off like samurai helmets. I yeah. could never unsee that. I could his, never unsee it. Yeah, and like his suit of armor is based on kind of the lacquer, you know, the lacquer breastplate of the samurai warrior. And his face mask also very similar to the, I guess like the face guard of the samurai, right? So you had that very kind of angular look, and yeah, absolutely. No, like with the, the with the bizarre with the bizarre uh, black voice of James Earl Jones, and and then the <laughs> different white actor. So many different influences. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. Um, no, that's awesome. Yeah. So there, there actually are a couple of other films here that I'd like to just sort of talk a little bit about. We did talk a little bit about like literary adaptations. So this one mm -hmm. uh, is. Uh, the Kazakh name is Shal, um, but it literally means the old man, all right? This is an adaptation, it's a filmic adaptation of the Ernest Hemingway book, The Old Man and the Sea. Oh, right? yes, I read it. This is like a survival film par excellence of one old man trying to find his way home in a blizzard while being pursued by a pack of wolves, all right? So even though, like again, like the old man in the sea, it's off the coast of Cuba, and this is fisherman who gets lost at sea, and he's trying to find his way home. Here, it's like a, it's an old, it's the old man in the step, basically, right? Um, and this film director actually, he made a trilogy. This was the middle film in his trilogy. Um, who's the director? Um, sure. I remember my teacher growing up played this film of Hemingway describing the old man in the sea. Uh -huh. And in the film, he says, he begs the people, do not look for any allegorical or deeper meaning. The plain meaning is the meaning. And yeah. she pauses the film and tells us he doesn't mean what he's saying. And it tells <laughs> us about all these deeper meanings about the old man in the sea. And I was sitting there appalled and I was like, you can't just make me unwatch what you just showed me. Like, <laughs> what? And, and it always... Um, Later in, in college, I studied the philosophy of art and aesthetics. And one of the questions raised in that in that field is always, what is the role of author's intent? So do you see any allegory in the film, or is it just a straight-up old man in the step? No allegories. Allegories are evil. No allegories. <laughs> the meaning of the passage is in the text. <laughs> it is historically grounded in the text. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Just channeling my inner Tarazi there. As you should. As I should, right. But anyway, uh, um, this director, uh, I'm still trying to find his name because he's really awesome. Uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, shoot. Oh, yeah, Aramak Tursunov. Okay, so this is actually part of a trilogy of films. This is the only one that's actually based off of a book, but um, he also made another film called The Daughter-in-Law, which, which is kind of an exploration of Kazakh film, like, of Kazakh womanhood, actually. Um, and the main actress is super, super hot. Like, I, I, like it's very titillating. I've not been that aroused by a non-pornographic film for a long time. Um, but uh, this is basically kind of an exploration of the Kazakhstani past. And this is kind of an exploration of the Kazakhstani present. And then he also made, recently, um, a film called The Stranger, which is a science fiction film about, again, we're talking about archaeofuturism before. This is his answer to, like, deliberate answer to the archaeofuturists, saying what is, the, what is the role of the Kazakh people in the future? Um, but, uh, his, his, um, his vision of what it means to be Kazakh in the daughter-in-law 
and in the old man, again, it's with reference, again, not to Islamic morality, but instead specifically to the, the uh, Tengrius and the pagan roots of the uh, uh, Mongol and Kazakh shared steppe tradition. And the, the role of the closeness of human beings to nature, that human beings are fragile and in constant need of support from the natural elements and, and in kind of like a symbiotic, sometimes very fiercely competitive relationship with nature. Um, and this got him into some trouble, especially with the daughter-in-law, because the uh, the sensuality of the film went very much against the traditional uh, Muslim ethics about uh, modesty. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is a this is a woman who is very unabashedly uh, uh, sexual. She is she desires uh, she desires the man in her life. Right, and she forms these close connections with three very different men. Um, and by the end of the and by the end of the movie, we're not even really sure which of the men is the father of her child. But it's it's actually in the end, it's her relationship with her mother-in-law that kind of provides the hope for the future. Not with any in the men in the movie, they are they're the hunters, they're the warriors, they are the they're the providers for the family, but they don't really impact. The future of the Kazakhstani people is the women who actually, you know, guarantee the survival of the Kazakhstani owl, right? Whereas in the in the old man, it's the relationship between the old man with his traditional shepherding ways and the and his grandson, uh, who plays video games at home. He doesn't understand anything about you know the traditional Kazakh way of life. He just watch watches American. TV shows. He plays the he plays the Nintendo console, right? He's you know he disrespects his grandfather at first, but then gradually, during the search for him as he's lost, he gradually comes to understand his grandfather, and he gradually comes to like listen for his grandfather's voice even when he's not there, and that's how they eventually find him. Um, so I'm, again, I'm not very sure. Again, like it's very like again we're talking about the archaeofuturism of these films, and he, he's not. He's very deliberately kind of poking the poking the bear in the eye in terms of like traditional religious morality, saying, "Oh, actually, let's look further down. Yeah, let's look further back." Right. That the traditional is actually new. Exactly. Exactly. And um, it's in stark contrast to, to film directors like Satayev, who directed *Warriors of the Step*, whose idea of step morality is very clearly rooted in. Uh, Islam in the in the Muslim tradition in, the, in yeah. the you know attention to the scripture attention to the law right so again we have these two very different understandings of what it means to be Kazakh one of which is state approved one of which is not, not state approved um, and these are these are kind of I mean I think like the reason that that uh, uh, Tursun Bayev is being so provocative with daughter in law and with the old man is because he wants to have this conversation about, okay, who are the, the Kazakh people? I mean, we have this we have this identity that is, you know, ancient, pagan, um, closely tied to nomadism. All right. Then we've got this we've got this intervening Islamic uh, conversion that happens. Like the the Turko Mongol people, they were not originally Islamic; they were originally Tengrius, and then they. They made a transition to Nestorian Christianity before ultimately becoming Muslim. Um, and then on the other side of this, we have the legacy of Stalin. We have the legacy of the Soviet belonging. And it's, it's actually very, it's actually a very tragic thing, but it's also very important to the Kazakhstani psyche. This, this idea that the Kazakhstani, the Kazakh identity is something that's best kept at home. You know, when you go out. You want to present yourself as a model Soviet citizen in mm. Western clothes, right? Uh, in, in neat, uh, like a suit and jacket and tie and black pants and, you know, maybe some stylish sunglasses to go with it. You want to, you want to show yourself as a Soviet, homo sovieticus, right? The modern industrial Kazakh, right? And that's what was cool 
Like again, the the big the big scene that defined a movie like Shiza is when the, he dons his black jacket and puts on his his stepfather's sunglasses. That's his initiation into the kind of the, the gangster side of things, right? But that, that's something that, you know, Gosara Omarava says we have to get away from. And she says that actually in another film of hers, The Native Dance, uh, which again, is, is kind of leading us full circle back to that, back to that like traditional roots, the traditional pagan roots of Kazakh uh, culture. That's where she says, kind of in a filmic way, Okay, that's where the goodness is in our society. That's where the hospitality is. That's where the that's where the truth truth to our word is, right? All of these influences from the West, all of the industry, all of the all the you know um, all the crime, all of the you know group grabbing after gold, grabbing after land. Like land theft is actually a, a big um, it's actually a big theme in both Shiza and Native dancer um and it's something that's kind of destroying the cosmos right so there are these there are these three very different um, um kind of stages in the cosmic identity that are kind of disconnected from each other but they're all in, in sort of constant tension with a conversation with each other and they're all involved in this conversation of okay who are we Kazakhs as a people are we actually soviets are we are we muslim or is there something deeper but, but like underneath all of this that we can get back to? Right. And that's something that's that's very like carefully explored in the in the cinematic genre, which again is itself a Soviet legacy. The film industry was brought to the Kazakh steppes when Stalin moved all of those factories in Belarus and Ukraine into the Kazakh steppes. Like a lot of the a lot of the great Soviet films, Ivan the Terrible, for example, was shot on the Kazakh steppe, right? And that's been the touchstone of like the Kazakh understanding of self since the like since this became a question under the Soviets, because they were about they were first about liberating all of these national minorities, right? Before they went and collectivized them. <laughs> it's, it's like it's multiple layers. Of irony here. Yeah, it's 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 the constant struggle that people are still going through for identity. I remember hearing out of Greece during their economic crisis, some people said, "Hey, uh, maybe this whole Greek orthodoxy isn't the right move. Maybe we need to pursue the old Greek gods, bring out the old pantheon." And you go to that pantheon, and you see this in in that anime I mentioned, the Blood of Zeus. But when you push that the Greek pantheon itself, the story of Zeus and Hades and and Mars and all all his you know brothers and sisters and all the Herod and all that, is that they themselves are the new gods, and then there are older gods who are the Titans. So it's a uh, it's a it's a chain of of trying to find what exactly are the roots and the identity of the people. But especially when you have things imposed on a top down manner, it's interesting to see. Again, in Ethiopia, we've had, um, sadly, some forced areas of conversion of Christianity and Islam. And so seeing the deeper roots of those people, there's a people called the Afar who are in the uh, the corner between uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Djibouti. And the Afar people are exactly okay. how you've described the Kazakhs. They are... Uh, they practice what's called, you know, syncretistic Islam. Like formally, they're they're Muslim and and likely Sunni Muslim because that's what's dominant in Africa. But a lot of them hold on to their their nomadic way of life uh, and pagan way of life that that preceded it. And you know, there's, there's something to that. I don't know. Like again, this is again, this is talking. This is going back to Tarazi, right? Where we're talking about a non scripture was this what was his terminology he talked about non <laughs> I, I myself was paraphrasing but like he was saying that okay. the mongols although they're not found in scripture they are a scriptural people interesting so it sounds to me like uh, what was the name of the nation you mentioned between ethiopia and Eritrea? the the afar it's not even uh it's a it's, it's it's a tribe it's one of the tribes 
Uh, but it's it's for example, you know, they are multi-ethnic these nation states, and uh, you know, there's no such thing as a Djiboutin. Uh, it's arguable whether there's an Eritrean or an Ethiopian, but the Afar ethnicity is found in all three states, and the, the most of them actually live in Ethiopia. But they're found in Eritrea, and they're found actually the way the Italians got in, and the whole Italian piece you mentioned earlier, is that. Uh, Eritrea, what's now called Eritrea was like three or four different kingdoms and there was an Afar sultanate that owned one of the ports and so the chieftain at the time sells it to an Italian company and then that company hands it over to that government. So that's how the Italians creeped into the Horn of Africa in the first place is because of an Afar sultan who sold them a port. Uh, but but that just shows you, you know, that these are kind of disparate people before that whole rush to Africa, the scramble for Africa. And uh, as uh, things needed to get demarcated, they got demarcated a little more specifically, but not always around uh, ethnic, religious uh, lines. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's very interesting, also a little bit sad and ironic, I guess, that, you know, they were, that they kind of went that route or were kind of forced to take that route. Um, yeah. But yeah, well, this has been great. Any and uh, I think this was a good kind of uh, survey of the films. Definitely send me a list of all those because it seems like some of them are spelled in English, but some of them are in Russian letters. I assume you could read uh, acrylic, uh, <laughs> uh, but I I cannot. So so please uh, send us the English titles so that we can uh, slowly take our times to to go through these films. Um, you mentioned Mark Twain earlier, one of my favorite writers, the great Samuel Clemens, and I, I did a book report on him as a kid. And I remember one of the things that he would always talk about, I'm paraphrasing again, because he has so many great quotes, but it's something to the effect of travel is a cure for ignorance and for biases. So if we can't travel due to Corona, we should at least travel through the film world. Absolutely. I'm, I'm done with that. And I actually fully agree with Mark Twain on this one. I don't agree with Mark Twain. And often, but I agree with him here. And absolutely, um, I'll send you the I'll send you a good list of. Um, actually, I did a blog post recently on my Happy Angle Orthodox blog. This subject matter probably is better suited to my Silk and Chai blog, but I began it with the. I basically began it with my blog. My blog began with a film review of the Nomad. Um, nice. So this has been with me since the beginning. I can actually send you a list of all of the Kazakhstani films that I've reviewed oh, perfect. Uh, on the heavy Orthodox. So, and that includes all the films we discussed here. So. Perfect. Perfect. Then, then that'll be a great way for, for me to throw it up on the YouTube. Well, thank you, Matt. And have, have a good one, brother. You too. Hannah. All right. Thanks.